So it's exactly one o'clock. Let's start this webinar. I am very pleased to welcome you to this first set of webinars of the Luxury Venture Group. A big thank you to founder Dipendra Pandey for the organization and also for inviting me to host these two sessions that we have this afternoon. So as I hear, we have an audience of uh, more or less 193 participants from 27 different countries. A big welcome to all of you. We can't hear you, unfortunately, at the very moment. 63% uh, of them are startups. And then we have many leaders from the different industries that we will be talking about today. So maybe just when we start two sentences on the Luxury Venture Group, for those who are not so familiar. LVG was founded last year and is the creator of a global venture capital platform and startup ecosystem for luxury and the related industries. It is Swiss-based and acts as an accelerator which scouts, selects and invests in startups from luxury and again the related industries. So this first webinar we're holding now hosts uh, focuses on the industry's watches, design, fashion and accessories. What everybody wants to know now, what will the new idea of luxury be? How is everybody coping? What will happen in the future? What are the strategies that need to be put in place right now? So I am pleased to welcome here on our screen panel, we have François-Henri Banabias, the CEO of Audemars Piguet. Welcome, François-Henri. We have Patrick Vermelinger, the head investment a uh, promotion of Switzerland Global Enterprise. Very warm welcome, Patrick. Hello. And we have uh, Alexis Gergopoulos, the director of the famous ICAL School in Lausanne, uh, all speaking from our trusted homes, as everybody at the moment, or nearly everybody. So let us start with a statement by François Henri. François, uh, Henri, what is the situation in your industry, the watch industry, and what are the biggest strategy changes for you right now? So welcome everyone. Uh, it's uh, pretty simple. The industry is on a very paused situation. We had to close our, all our manufacturing plants three weeks ago, and today we pretty much have 85% of the planet uh, closed in terms of access to retail stores. So we still have open China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong as we speak. Everything else is pretty much closed. So we have the time to think about what's gonna be the after, because it will definitely be an after. And the time that we have is actually pretty well uh, used as we speak. We've got roughly six to 700 people connecting every day amongst the, the whole company to discuss and plan the future. So when you say six to 700 people, how, how is that working? Do you do a lot of uh, video conferences? Are there still people working in Le Brasseau in the manufacturer? No, no, nobody's working in Le Brasseau. We started yesterday with maybe 20 people when normally we are 800 people just to test and see what, what's gonna happen. Uh, so I'm talking about six to 700 employees who are communi communicating every day via video conference or, or via emails to actually uh, work on as much as we can on what's gonna happen next. And the next is not two or three months, by the way, because the next two or three months are pretty much set. We know what's gonna happen. We know how down we got to, the business gonna become. So it's much more, oh wait, how do we have to look at a year ahead, two years and three years? So what would you say uh, are your main strategies to recover and thrive in this situation? Uh, I'm not going to share every single secret with you. <laughs> Even, especially when you told me that there were people from the watch world listening to that webinar. So we got to be careful. But what I can say is, I want. I've always looked at things with a glass half full and not half empty. And in and in years of crisis, and uh, where the the world is challenged in any in any way, shape, or form, I'm a firm believer that innovation creativity will come at its best. This is when we deal with tough moments than mankind 
come up with the craziest and the best possible ideas. And it's not only ideas about or how are we going to keep selling our watches and at that price point, all those type of things is much more what's going to matter more than ever now. When I say now, it's now, today, and tomorrow. And how will we be able to keep the momentum going with a brand like Audemars Piguet in the eyes of people without to be too much to your face, mm -hmm. no pretentious about this kind of spending, because re remember that luxury is all about emotions. Mm -hmm. And emotion could be at different price levels. But the higher you go, the more careful you're going to have to be in the coming weeks, months, maybe years, on the way you're going to spend your money. Mm -hmm. Because on the side of that, a lot of people will be left with a lot of difficulties and will have to be addressed that as well. So in terms of true communication and message from the brand, are we going to change the way we make our watches? No. Are we going to change potentially the message? Yes. But are we changing the DNA of the brand? No, absolutely not. If you say you might be changing the message, is this also about this idea again of how the perception or the idea of luxury is also changing? What is important today? How would you say Audemars Piguet is adapting to this change of message? I would say that there will always be a place for beauty, craftsmanship in the world. And craft could be done in many, many ways. And when you stay true to who you are and your origins, and when you open the curtain, you can show people that we haven't done anything different really for the last 145 years. We see that watch is made by people who are touching mechanisms every day. It's done by hand. These people are called the watchmakers. And the innovation that we see in today's world is much more on the te technicalities of putting and assembling these parts together, not on Digitalizing, digitalizing, sorry, digitalizing our watches. Meaning, we gotta keep making watches with different parts and mechanisms where everything is gonna be assembled by hand. Mm -hmm. And this has a long life, providing that we show even more to people where that came from. I'm gonna give you one example. The story and the birth of watchmaking was done in the 19th century because people, especially in the Vallée de Joux, were farmers and couldn't leave their house during the winters, which were too important and too cold. And they had to manufacture small objects, okay, to trade for food with Geneva and Lausanne. So the notion of confinement was already there. And through this time of people who have to be stuck in their homes, this is where creativity and craftsmanship came. So it's a completely different reason why we are in our homes today. But that doesn't stop us to be smarter and think about what we could do better for the future. So that's a platform that we're already working on right now. Yeah. So speaking of the future, what, can you maybe tell us a little bit more about some topics which are really urgent for you now? What, what are you thinking about as a CEO of a brand like Audemars Piguet? What, what is for you the most urgent topic? First of all, the time that we have doesn't make us do things in an urgent way anymore. And that's the good news about it. And what is urgent right now is actually not to rush and to take quick decisions because nobody knows what's going to be left out there when things are behind and for how long. So what do we know? We know that we're going to still manufacture watches. We're going to make watches. Okay. Are we going to make the same amount at the same the same numbers of watches? Maybe not. For how long? We don't know yet. So we have to adjust all those type of things. What are the implications? Are we going to spend as much money on the creating a new headquarter for the years to come? Thought in process. We'll decide later. Are we going to find the exact same world as we saw before with that wish to have our own dedicated points of sales where we can communicate directly to our clients? Absolutely which means that we're not going to go back to the type of multi-brand wholesale distribution. Mm -hmm. We want to, mm -hmm. to communicate and be in direct connection with our clients. That's pretty much the urgency, which is not urgent. 
We just lost you there for, for a little moment. Uh, so did you say uh, it would be interesting for us to hear a little bit more about your connection with your clients? So it's important for you to have the direct connection also with your clients. Yeah, we made the decision eight years ago to change our business model and we were wholesalers and we became retailers. Mm -hmm. So we had over 500 points of, points of sales and now we have only 150. And the goal is maybe to even go down to 100. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we want to be in direct contact with our clients mm -hmm. and with the number of watches that we make and the distribution network worldwide, we do believe that 100, 120 maybe points of sale could be enough to communicate with our clients. Mm -hmm. But we will not go back for safety reasons, if you want, to a multi-brand wholesale distribution model. You were speaking about digitalization before, and I think this is something which a lot of our participants will be curious about. There's always this talk about, can watches of a certain price point be sold online? At the same time, online, you can also make a direct connection to your, your clients, to, to the Udmar Pige fans. So uh, how are you going to be working in this so, uh, direction? So first of all, there is something that I'm asking everyone that listens today and to do me, the, to do me, not me only, but to the, the whole uh, network of people who are making high-end watches to stop calling the digital watches smart watches because that makes our watches stupid. Mm -hmm. And we are everything but stupid with the way we make our watches. So. This is, these are two completely different worlds. And yes, you've got the smartwatches, one part of the business, and then you've got the very high end of watchmaking. You cannot compare. You cannot compare a three-star Michelin restaurant with a fast food chain. No judgment call at all. It's much more two different animals that can perfectly live happy with each other. Now, going back to digitalization of our systems or selling online, these are two new tools that we can have to play with today. Do I look at this as the end of the game and we're gonna only do that? Absolutely not. No, we have to use this as like a new language that you would learn. And you learn this language, you use it as a new tool, but this is, this is not gonna be the end of the game. Because at the end, a screen, uh, uh, something that you would get on the phone will never never give you the full experience that we would love to provide our clients. Never, ever. We still have a lot of talks directly with people and they enjoy to know the behind the scenes and to feel the way people are. Because at the end, our world, as I said before, is only about emotions and who better than human beings can deliver emotions. So it would be interesting to hear a little bit more as, as the retail spaces which you are planning to either uh, further shrink to maybe only a hundred retail spaces, which of course makes it even more exclusive. <clears throat> Can you tell us a little bit what you're thinking, how these spaces will be designed? What can these spaces do? What can one expect when one enters such a space? So that's a, that's a big, big question. This is where I got an idea two weeks ago about what could be retail tomorrow. This obviously I won't share with you because that would be this is top secret, but what I can tell you is we are definitely looking at challenging that notion of retail store more than ever. Because today it's not about one size fits all. I'm going to give you an example. Are you a mother? Me? No. Yeah? No. Okay, so imagine now you're a mother. You've got two kids and you work and your husband works. And you have an appointment with me. And I'm your salesperson in the store in Geneva. You have to come and see me. And our appointment is at 10 o'clock. And that day, you are the one dropping the kids to school. And you are the one to come for the appointment. And you have only half an hour for me in the store. Then you have to move on with your life. That day, for whatever reason, that day doesn't start well. And you're angry. And you're, Mich you're Michelle. But when you call me and say you're going to be late, you are in a certain mood. I'm going to describe that mood as mood A. And that's you, Michelle. And if I'm smart enough, I'm going to tell you, you know what, Michel, don't come today. It's irrelevant. We are seeing each other tonight anyway, remember, because we have a special dinner in the store. Do not come now. We'll talk later. I don't need you in the store right now. Go and do what you have to do. That same evening, the same you will come for that special dinner. 
kids are taken care of, you're with your husband, everything's fine, now you can enjoy your, your day a little bit better, and you're gonna be in a mood B. If I don't adjust and adapt as a human being to you that day, then I'm gonna lose you potentially. If I show you, if I make you feel one second that I still want you in the store, because I still want to sell you that watch, I'm gonna lose you eventually. So today, a retail store couldn't and shouldn't be anymore just a place where you have to buy. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have to deliver slightly more than that. It could be a place where you just come to talk and express different things. And whether I sell you that day or I don't becomes irrelevant. So it's really if, being part of a family, having experience, having exchange, and be part in a way of the Oudmar Piguet family. Yeah, because at the end, we want you to belong and to feel that you belong, mm -hmm. not to feel that we're going to either use you at a certain time and we don't care about anything else. Mm -hmm. And that's the next big thing. Because today, look, we are four on the screen right now. Could, and I could ask the question actually to also 193 people listening to us, how fast could you describe a high-end luxury retail experience, whether in a restaurant, hotel, fashion, name it, anything that left you an unbelievable uh, feeling. Very unlikely, very unlikely, because we're making more and more, and I say we are making more and more mistakes every day, thinking that because we sell expensive items, everything should go and it's fine and, and the, the brain is on demand, so we don't have to work that, that much. That's completely wrong. So we have to rework and reassess completely what we want to deliver as a message to our clients, especially now that we're living through the crisis that we're going through. So it would be interesting to know one more, one more thing about uh, the new retail vision. So do you see that a store is not going to look anymore like a store how we know it today, like a traditional display of watches? Is this going to change in a large way as well? And this is the part where I would have to change my accent and to go a bit more uh, New Jersey or Brooklyn and say, you got to do what you got to do. But if you ask me the question one more time, I'll kill you myself. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot give you that answer. That would be sharing a secret, which is too important. Okay. Nice well, try though. Yeah. Th thank you so much, Professor Henri. That's really interesting to know. And uh, I have one question actually from the audience from uh, Anika uh, Lange or Lange. She, her question is, she says, looking at the opportunities of the COVID-19 crisis, how will Audemars Piguet implement new working positions in the fields of digital technology, customer centricity or sustainability? So this is about new working positions at your company. Is, is something changing here? Uh, definitely. First of all, we, we made a decision already four years ago to develop the at home uh, business. So now we have employees who are allowed one week to stay home and one week to go in a hub that we've put in different places in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So I do believe that we're going to see that increasing. And maybe tomorrow is going to be two days, two days at home and two days in a hub or three days, who knows. But we are living right now the fact that it's feasible, it's possible. Through the course of the crisis, we've had a lot of employees who have been asking us, their managers, say, what could they do to help, okay? Especially in the Valley de Joux and also in some other countries. So we've developed different programs here and there very quickly to do what we could do in a simplest, in a very simple, simple way. Mm -hmm. Now, two years, three years, five years, seven years from now, we are definitely looking at, at having even of a bigger purpose of what Audemars Piguet stands for and what it could do, not only for his employees, but for his clients, and for even people who are not either employees or clients. So there are many discussions on that topic as we speak. Thank you so much. I would also like to mention to our participants that it's also possible to ask direct questions now, which then we will use at the very end for a Q&A session. If you ask questions, please always let us know the person you would like to answer the question, and please send us very simple questions as this works best. Okay, well, thank you, François Henri, so much, and we'll speak again later uh, during our Q and A session at the end. 
So uh, let's go further to uh, Patrick Wermelinger, Patrick Wermelinger of Switzerland Global Enterprise. Uh, Patrick, uh, where do you see perspectives for uh, Swiss companies? Thank you first very much to inviting me to the to the call to the webinar. Uh, it's a pleasure. Maybe for those who don't know our company, because we have participants from all over the globe, a very warm welcome to all of you as well. Uh, Switzerland Global Enterprise is the official trade and investment promotion organization. We are present in all three language areas in Switzerland and in 27 countries uh, worldwide. As you have asked, we support Swiss SMEs on their way to new markets as well startups, and we help global companies to set up shop in Switzerland. Switzerland. Um, coming back to your question, so I will, I don't go into a specific industry focus, I will summarize what we have experienced over the past month uh, in Switzerland and as well a little bit uh, globally. So what we have found out that the, the current situation can be divided into three, three, three different steps. First, it's about surviving. And I don't know on where each company on the call stays, but topic number one, survive. It, it can be longer or shorter. Their liquidity is, is really key for the companies. Have access to liquidity if this is a topic. Um, stay in contact with your key clients and key suppliers, I think is very elementary in this time, not to forget about the ecosystem too strongly. And then in a second phase, it goes about stabilizing the business. This can be adaptation to, new, to the new situation. Uh, review your supply chain, uh, be it in Switzerland, but as well globally, and learn from this first phase of crisis. Before you then enter into step number three, grow your business. And there, I think, deeply as always analyzing customers' needs, which will change. And especially in the luxury industry, I think as you, Francia, as you said, luxury is about emotions. And the brands who, who, be, who are successful in discover what are the future needs and emotions people want to have by acquiring a product and combining those elements together, I think they have a great future to, to be successful on, on the medium and long run. So in this growth phase, it's about, it's about a digital boost, as we have already talked and tapped on about new supply chain. I'm convinced the world will look differently from that perspective and on new markets as well, which might open or, or close, we will see. So you're working a lot with startups. Uh, can you explain a little bit better uh, for us to understand how are you in contact with these startups? How can you support them in a, in a concrete way? Is this a daily exchange? Uh, do you do workshops with them? How exactly does it work? So I again distinguish between startup being in Switzerland, tackling international markets and startups being out in the world, having an idea to set up in Europe an activity or to expand into Europe and Switzerland. Yes, we do have um, tools on our website for the Swiss startups first to find out how export ready they would be. So what are the, the first questions and the second questions and what need to be in place to be ready to really go international? And then we have um, 18 consultants, geographically specific consultants, which can help you connecting the dots uh, from Switzerland to those relevant countries. This can be setting up uh, a shop there, but also um, finding partners, distribution partners, legal questions which might arise as well. We're having a, a different... Um, dossier about e-commerce, which is coming up in those days as well. So how to distribute products through e-commerce is, is a topic specific offering we have. And then if you are a startup out in the world, you can always contact our um, Swiss embassy. We have this, our experts there, which guide you through the process or which can help you connect you with the right people in Switzerland to get your business plan up and running. Mm -hmm. So as far as I see, you don't work uh, exclusively with uh, luxury and related industries. Can you tell, tell us how is it different for a startup in the luxury industry? I mean, luxury is something where many people maybe say, who needs luxury at, at this time? It's really about other things. 
Um, I, I wouldn't say we work differently. It, it's just so we are in Switzerland, every startup which has internationalization plans, uh, we are happy to support and to help. It's about defining together what are the ambitions, what are the targets uh, to, to achieve and which markets would fit best as well this. Maybe it's not the market the startup has in, in his mind. Maybe it's a, a different market which fits better with a better result. So really go step by step along the process based on each and in individual customer. Uh, and do you see an idea of luxury changing when you, you speak with your clients, which are actually the startups, so to speak? Is there this idea that there is a new luxury uh, on the horizon? Out of the discussions, our sales team and then consultants have, it's not yet clear if this happens. But personally, I'm convinced that um, luxury becomes a new content and can totally shift from what it's today to something new or have elements in it which today are not in it. So again, I think being close contact with customers and future customers or non-customers help each and individual company to find out what that could be. And I'm convinced that the, the, the participants in this call are already doing that <laughs> to, be, to be ready when it, when it takes off. Mm -hmm. Would you say that startups, which are more or less young companies, and it's probably their first really big crisis that they are facing, would you say a startup is better equipped to handle such a crisis as they are already in a phase of, of, of building, of finding themselves in the world? How do you see this? That's a good question, uh, with, Michelle. With, yeah. um, I would say companies which have gone through crisis, they have experienced this special, uh, now globally special uh, co condition. In a startup, yes, you're right. You are really um, with a lot of energy trying to build that up and to convince everybody from the investor to the clients, to the distribution partners at the end to, to take care of the after sales service and everything. Um, I would say companies which already have lived in such a in such a crisis or two or three times already gone through it, they have just this experience, which is a particular experience, which may help them better than maybe um, the crisis or the, the constant change in a startup environment. Mm -hmm. So as a startup, it's always difficult to really to find investors, to start making money, to, to make your business. Would you say there's are more startups are dying at the moment than usual, or is there? Do you see no real change? I think I think it's an opportunity for for the startups in those times because major corporations they will need to come up with new. Um, elements in, in their products, in their services. Um, startups are, are known for being agile. Uh, it's all about finding this spot of opportunity. And um, I'm convinced as Switzerland always has made perfectly this finding globally its niche where exactly what this startups produce or this company produced with a certain price can be sold. I think this is a good time to, to, to believe on, on this DNA of, of the Swiss startups when it comes to be successful, even though the crisis might come ahead of us. So speaking maybe also of Switzerland global enterprise uh, itself, you said you have, uh, it's spread out all over the world, you have uh, different affiliates in, in different countries. How is it for you, how many people are you and how are you working at the moment? Okay, we are in Switzerland, roughly 100 people, um, generally in three offices, but now um, all of us are working from home except three which are in the headquarters to take care on the most critical functions. Uh, then globally we are as well 100 people and depending on what which country they are in, some of them they have 50% home office, 50% back to work, but most of, uh, of us are, are back working from home. We are having weekly team calls. As Franzo said, we have not the six, 700 on the call, but as well 160 people on, on those calls, very uptight strategic wise, um, our, our employees, and where we make sure everyone is happy. And, and as well, the longer this home office period goes, that we stay connected and, and that we can address issues issues coming up um, early enough. Can you already see certain strategies of, of your company, of uh, Switzerland Global Enterprise that are changing or certain, certain ideas that are changing? So 
yes, of course. So we, we two years ago decided to go more digital. We have um, launched, <laughs> it was not planned to have this coincidence, but in February, it's a go global cockpit on our website, s-g.com, which is um, informing our clients from Switzerland about market potential and, and, uh, and export questions all on one portal. This is one thing. And currently we are also thinking, I think like any, any other country of, we, we organize 30 to 35 international exhibitions and fairs every year. And this year for so far, 80% has been or canceled or postponed. So we are working on a, on a prototype of a digital pavilion um, to, to be ready and, and permanently ready in markets with, with Swiss, um, Swiss products, Swiss companies, which can be an additional channel to communicate. I'm completely with Francois here that it won't um, replace the face-to-face -face contact, but as an additional communication channel to be more digital. Okay, well, thank you so much, Patrick, for, for your statement. We'll be hearing more of you later in our Q&A, and I would love to come to Alexi. Uh, Alexi, who is the director from the ECAL uh, School in Lausanne. Uh, Alexi, can you tell us a little bit about the working situation at the ECAL at the moment? I mean, as uh, <clears throat> my colleagues uh, said, we closed the school uh, mid-March and everything has been going on, uh, or let's say, through distance, through working through home. Um, uh, that applies, of course, both for the staff and all the, you know, the administration and, of course, for the students. Uh, we were, to be honest, expecting that to arrive. So we prepared ourselves as much as we could. So already from the first day, let's say, working at home, all the courses were starting to go online. It's, of course, something which we managed to do, but let's face it, I mean, uh, art and design is not necessarily the most suitable area to teach, you know, from home, especially, you know, if you want to do uh, photography, uh, uh, direct a movie, or uh, even, you know, uh, design an object and actually everything that we teach. It was quite a challenge, uh, to be honest, and uh, I think everybody responded really well, uh, teachers and students alike. Uh, but of course, yeah, for now we are looking at what will come after that, because um, there's many still questions to, to be you know, left uh, unanswered, and uh, we have to think about how we will be able to pick up all that specifically also for the graduating students, because I mean, these are the ones which we should care most right now, uh, how they will exit the school with a proper diploma and not like, you know, a, a COVID diploma given, you know, uh, through mail. We don't really want to do that. We will have to, we want to avoid as much as possible um, that. And we really want to, you know, put all chances on our side to really do a proper uh, diploma session and evaluation with the same standards as possible as the ones which were done previously. Thinking of the exhibitions of all the diploma students, which is always a big deal and something for everybody goes having, having a look, can you imagine to have the same kind of procedure and do it all digital? Um, I already know that many of our fellow schools in Switzerland and not just in Switzerland, but even in, you know, in England and so on have already planned to do that. Uh, to, be, to do it only online, I think, would be a mistake. I mean, as uh, Francois always said, you know, we, we produce things, we produce artifacts. Uh, and it would be a pity, you know, even with the best photography possible or with the best video possible to, to um, really, you know, do it only online and through a distance. Uh, I think what we sh must try as much as possible to really focus on the, the physicality of the works um, I think it's also about an experience, about a discovery of when you look at something uh, through your own eyes and not through the eyes of a, you know, a camera or a computer screen. And really um, add, of course, to that the other senses like you know, touch uh, or such. And you know, I, I think that what we could do eventually, depending on, of course, again, how things evolve, is to mix. To say, okay, we have a physical exhibition, but uh, there is also an online eventually platform for the people who cannot, you know, be there physically because of maybe other restrictions. Um, but again, uh, at ECAL, we will try our, our, the most possible to really have a diploma show, graduation show, 
this fall, as we usually do for the last, I don't know, six, seven years, uh, hoping that things would be, would, enab would enable it by then. Mm -hmm. And how do the students react to, to this new experience? I, I presume there's some students who, have, uh, who can adapt better to the situation and others which can adapt less. How can you support these different types of students? You know, I, I think it's, yeah, there's, you know, quite an insecurity basically from the side of the students and uncertainty at these times. And uh, back, you know, then we were trying to focus more on their projects and see you know, what we could provide as support for them to develop their project, to acquire a method in working, and to really push them as much as we can uh, in their creativity. Now the teachers have to dwell not just in that, but also more like on the, let's say, psychological aspect of the thing, uh, which of course doesn't make it easier. But I think you know, uh, in exceptional times, exceptional you know, measures and decisions, so we, we also try to provide as much as we can a support for these uh, students which are not, you know, um, which cannot, given the current situation, focus on their work because they have maybe other issues, uh, family issues, financial issues, um, and, you know, try to support them. So we have a, a specialized person who, which, which can be reached for that. And of course, the administration and the, myself and my colleagues are also there available to answer the eventual uh, questions. The ICA is also known as a kind of incubator working with different brands from the luxury industry specifically. Uh, so how do these, are these collaborations going further? How does this change uh, the outlook on such a collaboration? You're right. I mean, we have been, you know, quite well known for collaborating with different brands in the luxury industry and not, not only, uh, in all, actually all areas. Um, of course, it's a big question. How will these companies, you know, react to the current situation towards us? Um, also, depending on, you know, will the, the projects maybe be dropped, basically, or will they evolve with the, the current needs? Uh, I think that what everybody should know is that the thing that uh, in these, uh, you know, times, creativity, again, uh, I think must prevail. And we, uh, there's many answers to be found in there. Uh, given the current, you know, stressful and uncertain situation, art, design, and again, creativity generally, I think, are there to prove that, you know, there is hope, first of all, and there is many solutions to be found. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, basically, you know, if you look at uh, all that has been, ha been happening online, um, all the um, uh, open source, you know, protection masks and other uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, products that have come up. I think that's all works from designers who have, you know, in a record time have come up with solutions. And I think that shows that, again, even if it's not the most, let's say, um, obvious field of, of, a, of a design, uh, it's something which design and creativity can give answers to and ease the current situation. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, and it's also about being agile. I think to adapt in the current situation is something also very important to be able to not, you know, remain in the eventually past positions of another time, but uh, know exactly what are the, the main issues on which to focus. And I, I would think also to go back to something a bit more essential. I think that's something which would be uh, common in, in many, many, many fields. Um, yeah, but, uh, I think there's a lot of change coming, but maybe, maybe again, in some areas, it will not be a bad thing to do. Speaking of change and essential, you are really working with the next generation of young, innovative, creative people. So uh, being in this situation that you are, what do you think is the next big thing or could be the next big thing coming out of this, uh, this lockdown? I mean, uh, following, uh, you know, following the lockdown, uh, I think that Despite of what people may think, we will see more and more people going, let's say, uh, more into an entrepreneurial way. I mean, when I mean people, I mean people from the creative industry. Mm -hmm. uh, because, of course, the companies will maybe have eventually some other things to deal with. And um, it's been something which we have anyway been looking into for the last three, four years through different collaborations and also by helping the students to really uh, become better in their self-employee situation. 
Um, of course, that as a startup basically gives, you know, needs a lot of agility, a lot of commitment, a lot of work. But I think um, now more than ever, it makes you become, you know, your own boss and your own master of decisions and eventually um, cut through different steps and different levels of decision making um, and, and so on. So we'll see how, how that evolves. And we have been also, you know, being since many years now, uh, being uh, partners with the IMD, the business school in Lausanne, which also um, we collaborate in, in these fields too, in uh, entrepreneurship and uh, also how you can start your business. So I think, yeah, it's, it's things which are, uh, which are extremely important for us to, to be really able to, to focus on, but without losing our essence, which is creativity in art and design and every, all the other creative fields. No, so, so in a way, you also see a lot of positive aspects also coming from this very special situation. Yeah, I, I think we must. <laughs> we don't have a choice. You know, it's a, it's a one way, one way street. I mean, uh, we have to be optimistic. We have to be agile in, in our minds, first of all, and overall, I think in the way we work. And, uh, you know, being, being able to be uh, courageous and face the situations with a very, you know, uh, straight face and not try to fool ourselves or anybody else of, on what's going to happen. And, and I think that's also what we try to, to give uh, our students right now as an information. You know, we don't try to tell them, oh, everything is perfect. Don't worry. You know, I think we have to be completely transparent on, on what's it going to happen, what, what's happening now and also what will eventually happen in the future, in the near future. Maybe one question uh, on interna internationalization. Uh, normally you have many different shows around the world where you can showcase the work of, of the ECAL, the work of the students. You have many international uh, artists, designers, protagonists coming, uh, coming to the ECAL to teach. Do you see a change or, or a loss in this direct exchange, or do you think it's something which can also be done digitally? I, I think, you know, definitely the, we do a lot of, we participate in a lot of important fairs. Uh, we do a lot of exhibitions on our own uh, or all around the world every year. And we invite, and we also travel with students abroad in different uh, uh, amazing places uh, in collaboration with brands or other schools, definitely there will be a time of adjustment. Um, I, I think that uh, there will be a time, I don't know how long it will take, but which will, will have to combine physical presence and travel with things which, let's say, could also be done uh, from a distance. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's not necessarily a bad thing to do. Uh, I think, again, it's better to focus on, again, I was, I was saying before, on some more essential things and really travel or go to meet people or uh, participate in a fair or do an exhibition abroad when we really need to do it. Um, of course, you know, the last years maybe were uh, times where everybody, you know, wanted to travel because it was nice, it was cool. Uh, invitations were, you know, flying from here and there all around the world. Yes, it's extremely rewarding, uh, but at the same time, uh, I think it, uh, be a bit more introspective in some moments, uh, again, is not necessarily a bad thing to do. Thank you so much, Alexi. We have, a, it, it sounds like an interesting time at the ICAL and we're looking forward to all creativity coming from the ICAL. We have many, many questions coming in and I'm receiving them actually by WhatsApp here. Uh, so let me just go through some of these questions. Uh, a question from Elena Molia for François Henri. Uh, François Henri, do you think that blockchain solutions could positively affect Udmar, Udmar's direct relationship with customers? Um, let's put it this way. Everything that's going to help us showing absolute transparency on the whole manufacturing process and the ownership of a watch, when the watch is going to be purchased first and then resold, is a winner, no matter what. The exact how we're going to do this is not clear yet completely, but we will live in a world where we won't be able to hide anything anymore. And it's the goodest, that's a good news actually about the whole thing, because the young generation, especially, 
is asking us every day, us, the brands, not us or the Marpillier only, to open the curtain and say, what you say in your advertising, is it completely real? Show us exactly what you stand for. And everything that's going to help the process will be an additional good thing for the business. Speaking uh, a little bit more about the business, we have uh, from Shil uh, a question. Knowing your attachment with contemporary arts, do you think that doing special projects with artists presented in stores could be an opportunity to target new customers? Of course, thinking of your special engagement you have with Art Basel, working with artists on creating big bespoke works. Is this something where you see you're getting to new customers or what is the idea behind it? So first of all, we have, since uh, we've, we've started our partnership with Art Basel, we have been bombarded with offers to work with artists and ex exhibit the art in different places. At some point, we have to put a, a sort of, uh, of a wall between these worlds. Because yes, we want to support contemporary art because we do believe that at the end, working with artists also helps us thinking different and potentially look at the world in a different way. And we have a special art commission at Audemars Piguet where people, with people who are not working for Audemars Piguet to keep an absolute neutrality about it. But at the end, are we gonna make an artist work on the dial of our watches? Mm, not really. Are we gonna start to exhibit art in our boutiques and our stores? Not really, because that wouldn't give the respect it deserves. So it's much more always about the quality on the way we're gonna do it, much more than on the quantity. But does it make sense at some point to share the emotion of contemporary art with our clients? The answer is absolutely. So it's also something which is about experience again, but I think it's also important to always have different contexts. There is the context of the contemporary art world, there is the context of the watch world. It's interesting to interact, but still it's interesting to respect certain boundaries. Perfectly said. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so let me see some other questions. Uh, I see here questions about online security in sales. This is maybe something Patrick Vermelinger, you could answer for us. Do you ever have issues speaking with your, your startups about online sales and the security problem it can or cannot produce? Your mic, Patrick, your mic. Oh, yes, we can. Yes, yes now I'm here. Uh, I would have to ask our team uh, on that. I didn't hear anything so far, um, but would have to double check. Yeah. Uh, no, no, cannot say. Is this an issue for you, François Henri, as you are also a retailer, online security for online sales? Sure, absolutely. And we have, we have procedures and when we work with different banks and credit card entities, so we have training for all our people. And that doesn't stop the fact that sometimes, yes, one thing slips through and th there is an issue. But I would say that overall, it's pretty safe because of all these procedures put in place by by and the, the, the credit card people, the bank world. So we work very closely with each other and it's, it's, it's good. Then we have a, a question from, uh, I'm saying this wrong probably, from Shil Xu. Uh, it's about the Chinese Z generation consumers. I mean, we were speaking about the Z generation. Alexi, you said the Z generation which is more or less your students, are a lot more entrepreneurial. So is this something that you also work on at the ICAL, how to reach out to, to different customers for the future, let's say the Chinese set generation, which of course as a luxury brand, for sure you would want to reach out to. Yeah, we, are, we are a school, so we're not a luxury brand, but uh, nevertheless, for us, it's very important to attract uh, foreign students uh, because I think it helps the, the, you know, the mix in the whole, whole school. And we have a quite high percentage of foreign students coming from all over the world. Um, <clears throat> for me, it's not about attracting one you know, nationality or area of the world more than the other one. It's about offering the best possible uh, you know, experience when they are at school and also uh, 
knowledge when, of course, somebody is studying. So that's, I think, something which we really uh, take a lot of care in doing. And then, of course, offering the most, you know, in terms of, uh, of um, after, I, wouldn't, I, would, I would say after sales, to take a, a, a wording from the watch industry, but it's also how we, we cater on the students' works after they leave, how we exhibit them all around the world, how we also connect them to companies, uh, how we also, we, we, uh, we, we anticipate eventually the needs of a company and we really tell them, okay, go and work with that graduate from us because he really knows exactly what maybe you will, you're looking. And it's also in terms of, uh, you know, being a bit more entrepreneurial, I think that every, you know, designer who sets up their own studio or every, every artist basically is their, an entrepreneur. I mean, they have to, to take care of uh, their business, their image, their uh, financial side. So I think it's, it's something which is very important to, to give them skills. And as I was saying again, uh, we have been setting up with IMD a series of courses on that and different uh, programs, which are not yet uh, you know, uh, finished. We are still working on something more important for the year to come. But then again, it's it, as how can we remain relevant you know, and be adapt, adapt to the current situation um, knowing also that the, the needs are not the same depending on, you know, on which field you are also, uh, you are also developing your activity. Mm -hmm. Speaking from uh, students from different uh, continents, let's say uh, American students, uh, Asian students, uh, European students, do you see in this said generation a different approach to certain problematics or would you say it's, it's quite globalized? I mean, I couldn't give you exact, you know, examples, but I think it, there is a globality. I think that's unavoidable. And of course, bringing all these uh, different nationalities in one place in Lausanne, Atecal, I think at the end um, makes that the, the differences or the approaches uh, come out during the, the studies as projects. So of course we see um, there's maybe on the, a more technical and entrepreneurial actually way of working maybe for more Asian students, uh, more, you know, electronics, appliances and things like that. Um, maybe a more, I don't know, uh, socially driven uh, approach from European students. So it, it's quite different, but I think at the end, um, the, common, the common, you know, line is that they can do uh, everything, everything that they do with the same very good skills that we have eventually tried to, to, to teach them. And when they go out in the professional world, they are not just, you know, ex uh, experts in one thing, they are experts in many things. Speaking about sustainability, it's something we really haven't spoke about so much today. And speaking again of your students, do you also see different kinds of students who are interested in, in uh, the value of sustainability in the luxury industry, outside the luxury industry, how omnipresent is this topic? It's a topic which, you know, has come, let's say, on its own in the last few years, not just in the luxury industry, but in all the other fields that we are working on. Um, it's, it's something which we didn't even had really to, to push, to be honest, because I think, you know, we have to trust the young generation they quite they know quite well uh, what are the things to come, and uh, we are really lucky to be able to work always with young people. And I think that's a chance as a school because you know the we get older, the teachers get older, the staff gets older, but the students remain always young because they always uh, change. And I, I think that's quite amazing, you know, if you think about it. So you're really faced with uh, always what is you know the the most. Uh, actual, the most uh, hip, the most uh, innovative uh, perspectives from the young generation. And yes, sustainability is one thing. But of course, you know, uh, as, as an art and design school, we also have to teach them uh, a broader perspective always. And uh, I think that's also very important to make them understand and maybe also try to show them how, by contrast, you can be sustainable and maybe on complete opposite, not sustainable. And then through this construct, I think it's all about also learning how to, to be able to, to adjust depending on the situation and uh, the different contexts. But we have, you know, some very, very good projects coming up uh, or realized in the last uh, year. 
um, with really are tackling real issues. For example, uh, sustainability, you know, with the, you know, diapers, for example, what do you do with baby diapers, uh, which you can, you know, there's a huge, huge consumption and, you know, how, what materials can come up to. Uh, I mean, it's not a very luxury topic, of course, but I think it's, it's an essential thing. Uh, and again, I mean, it's, it's things which, again, we don't have to, to force, you know, and then of course we support it. We bring uh, people who know about it to teach. We, we really also, uh, in the collaborations we do with the industry, also, we always now put that parameter as something which is needed. Uh, and I think it's also, in a way, our responsibility to, you know, um, try to, to, to show also the industry from our side that things can be done in a different way, not the way that they have been done in the last, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. Um, as I, I think we, we see ourselves also as the, the holders of, you know, what's to come next, uh, trends, uh, uh, society changes and uh, materials, uh, topics and so on. And aesthetics, of course, and uh, the, you know, communication and uh, yeah, and the rest. Thank you, Alexei. Uh, I have another question for François-Henri from Julien. Uh, would Audemars Piguet invest and participate in luxury startups ecosystem, just like the Luxury Venture Group? Let's put it this way. What I said earlier is in those kind of times, creativity, innovation is going to be key, obviously. So it's not that we have already a system put in place where we say we're going to, we're going to uh, take uh, five, 10 or 20 million a year to put into startups. But uh, two things I wanted to say is one, I'm always welcoming ideas and people know pretty easy how to find me. And I'm always interested in looking outside of our world to, to understand what's going on. I myself was never a good student. I didn't graduate at anything. I don't have a single diploma. Uh, so I love learning from everywhere. And if people have great ideas and they arrive to us, who knows what could happen? So I'm not never closing the door, never closing the door. And in that respect, I saw the questions coming on the screen while we are talking. Uh, please, Michelle, make sure that we get them. And we should, as a speakers of today of this webinar, answer to them all. There were some very good ones. I won't be able to treat them all. But I would love to be able to answer, OK, after that, to all the girls who have asked questions. Okay. okay. No, let's make this happen because I'm getting certain questions here on WhatsApp because I can't look at the, at the screen at the same time. But let me have one other question, uh, which is also for you, uh, Francois. It's uh, Fiorella who says, do you believe there will be a shift in consumers' consumption patterns for luxury watches following the current crisis? If yes, how will you be dealing with this shift? So I don't think we're going to see a shift. I think we're going to see a slowdown for quite some time. Because when we know what's going on and we actually don't know the end of what's happening, take the US, take the US market, for example. It's our number one market at Audemars Piguet. And look at what's the unemployment rate before the crisis and where it's going to, where it's going to end. You might have 25 to 30% of the population without a job by the end of the whole thing, which is huge. So it's going to give a sort of, uh, of a vibe, which is not going to be good for consumption, especially luxury. People will have to really make choices. And for quite some time, we might see a slowdown. The slowdown doesn't mean death at all. It doesn't mean that it's over. It means that people need to reflect and the brands will deliver the best possible message and will stay true to who they are in terms of delivering, again, those emotions craftsmanship, legitimacy, authenticity will win eventually. Now, is it going to go through a wave? Yes, I do believe it will. And it's good. It's good. We cannot always say, okay, uh, it's, on, on dit en français, un arbre ne pousse pas jusqu'au ciel, a green, uh, tree doesn't grow to the, to, to the sky. Okay, so we are living with something. The great news about it, it does oblige us, oblige us to change the way we are doing our business before. I always look at this as good news. Yeah. Change is always good, absolutely. I have now uh, one last question I would like to ask you. It's a very simple question, and we will check the other questions so we can still answer them uh, online later on. 
So this last question is about the Hotel des Horlogers of Audemars Piguet. Do you have any update on this project? Uh, yes, it's still a work in progress. We're slightly behind, even more so now with the COVID because we had to let to, to have all the people working on the hotel leave the, the, the place. Uh, we have heard that we're going to start again very soon and we will open this fantastic designed hotel uh, by the winter 2021. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So I just have some few last words. <clears throat> First of all, a big thank you to all of uh, our three panelists. Great job. Thank you so much. Some last words. We have the LBG Boot Camp for Startups, which will be happening from the 18th to 20th September 2020 in Geneva. There's going to be a luxury venture conference happening in 2021. And next year, the Luxury Venture Group is also launching its accelerator program where startups can apply, get funding, and are invited to Switzerland for up to three months. Dipendra, uh, the founder of Luxury Venture Group, will announce more details by mid of 2021. For further news, please follow the Luxury Venture Group on Instagram. And a big thank you again to everybody for being part of this. And we have a second panel coming up at 3.30 today, if you want to join us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.